So this is an exciting milestone lecture because in this lecture, we get to finish our journey of electrostatics. We have introduced lots of quantities here, um, but we're gonna introduce one more and that is capacitance. And in doing so, we'll have built ourselves up to understand one of the two key pra parameters of a transmission line, which is the capacitance per unit length. And so let's try to put everything into perspective and, and let's stop and, and look back at where we have come so far. So in this entire section on electricity, there's really only three things that we have been dealing with, right? Everything can be reduced to three pieces. The first is electric charge. That had units of coulombs, although we also sometimes dealt with charge density or charge that's distributed across the line or across the surface. And that was the first quantity. The second thing that we introduced was this notion that when we have charges, we can exert forces on other charges. The two charges are either going to repel or attract depending on the signs of those charges. And to keep track of that, we introduced an electric field and we designated that with a vector which has a direction and a magnitude and we called it E for electric field. Um, the units of charge were coulombs and the units of electric fields was either Newton per meter or, four, or sorry, Newton per coulomb, it's force per coulomb or it's volt per meter. All right, so you can either describe field as being related to charge or you could describe it as being related to potential, potential energy, um, which we call the voltage or electric potential. And that was also a scalar, it had units V and that V was volts. All right, so these are the three basically building blocks of electrostatics or electricity. And what I wanna emphasize is that all three of these things must exist together. There's no way that we can have one without having at least some of the other two. The moment that you separate two charges into a positive and negative and you pull them apart, you are creating electric potential that has a different value at different places, and you're creating forces um, that could be there if you place a third charge somewhere else, so you're creating an electric field. And we so far have come up with different governing relationships that tell us how these three are going to relate to each other. In particular, there was that the divergence of the electric flux density, remembering that D equals epsilon E. Right, there was also the divergence of the D field is equal to the volume charge density at any location, which was just a fancy way of saying that electric flux lines D have to start and stop at positive or negative charges respectively. Right, then we also introduced this notion of a potential field or electric potential. And we stated that the electric field could be written as the negative gradient of this scalar field B, which is basically telling us that the electric field is going to point in the direction where the potential energy is decreasing the fastest. That's all the gradient means. Or gradient means increasing, but the negative sign converts it into decreasing. And finally, we had Poisson's law, which told us that the second derivative, spatial derivative of the voltage is equal to negative rho V over epsilon, right? So these three things are sort of our fundamental relationships. And what you will notice about all of these is that they are linear. What linear means is that if I double the value of the charge density everywhere, then I must be also doubling the value of the divergence of D and therefore the um, doubling value of D everywhere. Same could be said about voltage and electric field. If I double the, values of uh, the value of voltage everywhere, I'm also doubling its spatial gradients, which means I'm doubling the value of the electric field. So these things are all linear and connected to each other, right? And so the one thing we have not covered is how do charge and voltage relate to each other? And so we're gonna get ourselves to a relationship Q equals C, times V. C is what we're gonna call the capacitance. And what it basically tells us is if, if I have two objects, each of which can carry some amount of charge, right? And one of them, I'm gonna place a positive charge on it. The resumption is that there has to be negative charge on the other. And in doing so, we're going to have to have 
a change in voltage or a change in potential between the two. I'll call that a delta V right there. And what this, this linearity property tells us is that if I scale the amount of charge, I should also be scaling the voltage difference between these two objects. And vice versa, if I scale the voltage, I'm also scaling the charge by the same amount. And so it makes sense that there ought to be a constant in proportionality between the charge and the voltage. And that's what we're gonna call C for capacitance. All right, so with that, let me introduce you to a diagram that I think is gonna summarize everything that we have covered so far. All right, so we've got these three quantities. We've got charge, we've got flux or field, which are essentially the same thing. They're just related by the permittivity and we've got potential. And look at all these relationships that we have now um, you know, uh, come up with. All right, first here is uh, uh, Gauss's law. That is a mistake right there. Okay, let's get rid of that epsilon. I'll have to fix that in the slides. Uh, Gauss's law tells us that the gradient, the divergence of the electric flux lines is equal to the uh, um, electric charge density, rho V. Right, so that was a quick way to get from one to the other. If you want to go the other way, you can also apply Gauss's law, but in the integral form, in which case you can take the line integral of the electric field, uh, sorry, electric flux density, dotted with a, um, a around the surface, right? This is a, a surface integral, and that's going to be equal to the total charge that's within that. And that's a way to go in the opposite direction. So this is two sides of the Gauss's law coin, helps us go back and forth between charge and, uh, and flux. All right, now to go between flux and potential, we have a couple of tricks. The first in the direct differential form is we could take the gradient of this potential field, and that's gonna tell us immediately what the electric field is. If you wanna go the other direction, we wanna start out with electric field and get to voltage, we can take a line integral because the electric field is the rate of change of the voltage of the electric potential. And so if we take a path integral, we're integrating all those little contributions. We're integrating that rate of change to get how much the electric potential changes from point B to point A. All right now, the other branch that we're considering is charge and potential. And this was Poisson's law. And you can get Poisson's law basically if you start out at flux and first you go to potential and then you go to charge, right? So you take a uh, take this line integral and then combine it with uh, um, with both directions. Sorry, I drew that incorrectly. Hang on a second. If you start a potential and you go to flux field, and then from there you go to charge, right? You can basically apply the gradient formula and then apply Gauss's law in differential form. Put those two together, and you get Poisson's law that the second derivative of the voltage equals uh, negative rho v over epsilon. All right, and there's one more link here that's missing, which is to go in the other direction, to go from charge to potential. We can just calculate what this capacitance is and then multiply it by our voltage to get our Q. Um, and so those, those are gonna be directly related to each other. All right, so that should give you a background on uh, what capacitance is and how it fits into the complete picture of electrostatic so far. Um, in the next video, we are going to talk about um, what capacitance means computationally, um, and uh, we'll, we'll go through a brief example.